When it comes to climate change, it seems to me that one of the major challenges facing us today is finding the correct discourse. We don't seem to have the right language for talking about climate change, or maybe in a way we have too many different languages and no common language. We all know that the technocratic discourses that drive progress are the same discourses which are um, the custodians, in a way, of natural disaster, and that these same discourses see, still seem to want to promise us a way out. And we also all know that the humanities seem to have more or less nothing to say. I'm reminded of what Theodore Adorno wrote at the beginning of the Negative Dialectic, when he said, Once upon a time, compared with sense perception and every kind of external experience, it was felt to be the very opposite, that is, philosophy was felt to be the very opposite of naivety. Now philosophy has objectively grown as naive in its turn as the seedy scholars feasting on subjective speculation seemed to Goethe 150 years ago. The introverted thought architect dwells behind the moon that is taken over by extroverted technicians. So what do these introverted thought architects have to say? I'm interested in this once upon a time, and Adorno talks about the time of Goethe. I want to talk about the time of Herder. I was drawn to a rather remarkable statement that Herder makes towards the end of his Letters for the Advancement of Humanity, a collection um, that he wrote in 1796. And in a way, all I want to do is to take this statement apart and try and ask if there's anything in it that's of interest or relevance for us today when it comes to talking about climate change. So this is the statement in full, and I'm going to be reading it in English translation. All of the uh, citations that I'm giving you today are in English, and um, they are, um, I think, almost all of them my own translation. A little bit of self-advertising. This translation is from my forthcoming um, complete translation of the letters on humanity to be appearing with um, Cambridge University Press as volume four of the selected works in English. So this is the statement that interests me. Herder writes, the greatest revolutions of the human species have so far depended upon inventions or upon revolutions of the earth. Who is familiar with these in the unforeseeable progression of the ages? Climates can change. For many reasons, many inhabited countries can become uninhabitable. Many a colony can become a motherland. A few new inventions can replace many old ones. And since the greatest effort, undeniably the character of almost all European statesmanship, must necessarily decrease or run away with itself, who can calculate the consequences? It appears true that our Earth is an organic being. We crawl about on this orange like small, barely noticeable insects, tormenting one another. And we set root from place to place. As the saying goes, if the heavens fall, where will the sparrows stay? If the orange becomes moldy in places, another generation will perhaps appear, without the demise of the first one having been caused by the intellectual aspect of its system, the understanding. Instead, what it was able to carry out was debauchery, vice, misuse of its understanding. The periods of nature are certainly calculated with mutual consideration of all species, so that when the earth can no longer provide humans with warmth and nourishment, humans will have fulfilled their determination upon earth. The bloom wilts as soon as it has blossomed in full, but it leaves behind it the fruit. If the highest expression of intellectual force would be our determination, then this itself would require of us that we leave a good seed for the unknown eons, so that we do not die as spineless murderers. How are we to understand this statement written once upon a time with an eye to its own future, to perhaps our own day? How are we to understand it today where climate change means something quite different from what Herder wrote when he spoke of the changing climate? I want to make a couple of points. Um, the first one is a kind of a parenthetical note on Herder's notion of 
culture and folk and belonging. Um, I'll keep this brief. My second point, I think I've already mentioned it, and I might have even said enough about it already, concerns the division of the disciplines when it comes to speaking about climate change. Um, and then my main point has to do with natural history and with the mutability of the given, how we look at the relationship between the historical and the natural, how we use the two concepts to think about each other and the role of the understanding and the intellect in this process. So my parenthetical note about the position, the belonging, the uh, situatedness, the rootedness of human beings upon this planet, upon this orange, um, the place that the insects crawl about on. Herder is genuinely regarded as the proponent of um, culture in place, um, culture being formed by climate, um, more or less encapsulated in its own position and very little interaction between um, between cultures. And this is uh, certainly not what he intended with his um, anthropology. So um, for him, there is, of course, the important factor which is given by the development of a culture in a particular place, the way it relates to in its environment, the way it relates to its own history. And I'll be saying a little bit more about that later. Um, but there is also the vital aspect of cultural exchange and migration, which determines um, any human cultures. And I'm reminded time and again of a rather lovely image, which he wrote in his journal on um, the voyage at sea between Riga and Nantes in France in 1769. And I'm just going to read a brief passage, just because it's a very enjoyable passage. So Herder is looking out at the vast expanse of the ocean and he writes, The fish that come up near the surface are only birds, their fins only wings, they're swimming, flying, or fluttering. Who would claim to decide from them alone everything that is in the sea? What if a sparrow were to raise itself to the moon? Would it afford a true indication of life on our earth? What a great vantage point from which to view the nature of men and sea creatures and climates, from which to explain them all and explain one from the other and follow the development of the great world drama. You can see the line of reasoning that ties this early statement to what he wrote 30 years later. It's the idea that you can talk about natural phenomena more or less in the same breath that you talk about history, and that you can illuminate one from the point of view of the other, and that it is perhaps helpful to complicate the two. So let's look at how um, this is uh, developed in the later writing. When I read that statement about the earth as an orange and uh, people like insects crawling about on it, there are a number of things that strike me as being um, apposite, pertinent, relevant perhaps to our current discourse of climate change, and I just want to mention a couple of them. First of all, there's what could be called a shift in spatio-temporal perspective from the historical to the cosmological. This drawing back from, to the point where human beings and their history and their movements and their places start to look like insignificant insects on a ball of matter floating in space. Then, secondly, there is the accompanying decentering of human life. This quite bold statement that when human life has fulfilled its uh, capacities, when it's lived out what it can live out, then it's not needed anymore, but the planet is still there. So there's the sense of a perpetuation of life over and above the history of humanity. And then finally, the planet is not the same thing as humanity. It, it is, as he says, an organism. And I think that these are all ideas which will in our own day become very important when it comes to understanding what it means to live on a planet which is being changed by human activity, by industrialization and capitalism.
There's another reason why I find it interesting and worthwhile to talk about this particular aspect of Herder's writings in the context of the Anthropocene and of uh, climate change. And that is indicated by Dipesh uh, Chakrabarti in his book, The Climate of History in a Planetary Age. And I'm just going to read what Chakrabarti has to say um, when considering the history of the Anthropocene. He writes, it is the moral side of the Anthropocene debate, questions of historical responsibility for the warming that has happened so far, that requires us to translate ideas that have deeply to do with Earth history, geology, and geological time into the language of world and human history. This entails, however, two important acts of displacement. The displacement translation of the category force, referring to the physical pull that one material body exerts on another, to go by the Newtonian understanding of it. Thus, humanity as a geological force. The displacement translation of this category into the human existential category of power and its sociological institutional correlates, and the accompanying dislodging of the problem of the Anthropocene from the realm of geological time to the time of human or world history. Now, what I find really interesting when bringing Herder's writings to these thoughts, and this is what I'm going to talk about now, is the fact that this distinction between force and power, between the Newtonian aspect of physical interactions and the human historical interactions, it's much too simplistic a distinction if we take Herder at his word. Um, in fairness to Chakrabarti, he then does go on to complicate the distinction himself, but I'm interested in the ways that Herder complicated it. So when I look at Herder, it seems to me that he's trying to find ways to talk about natural processes as historical processes, but he's also finding ways to talk about historical processes as natural processes. And the key concept here is revolution. Herder uses it to destabilize the distinction between the natural and the historical. Just look at the way he introduces this passage that I read. He says, the greatest revolutions of the human species have so far depended upon inventions or revolutions of the earth. And that's all. Then he drops the topic of revolution. But even in this uh, short statement, in this short introductory paragraph, we see that revolutions are being used in the same way to talk about inventions, to talk about human activities, and um, about the revolutions of the earth. So the natural and the historical are being gathered together under the same uh, umbrella concept. And this, and this is another lasting preoccupation of Herder. He, remember, he's writing now just seven years after the storming of the Bastille. And uh, this has to be provocative to be writing in this particular way. So the argument is that when we try to understand historical revolutions, it helps to think of them in terms of natural revolutions and um, vice versa. Natural revolutions can also be understood in a way like historical revolutions. In many respects, he's continuing the line of thought from a decade earlier when he wrote his ideas on the philosophy of the history of humankind. As it turned out, Herder was bringing his ideas on the philosophy of history more or less to a conclusion around uh, 1789, 1790, 1791. So clearly the revolution was on his mind. And when he wrote the notes for the continuation of this project up to the present day, because that was more or less where he had arrived so far, he'd arrived at a history of the present. And when we look at his notes that he wrote around this time, it's quite interesting because he is eager to emphasize revolution not as a sudden overturning um, of the natural order of things and the natural order of history, but as a slow and gradual development of natural 
um, tendencies, a, a realization of natural forces, if you like. And so he, um, he emphasizes the beneficial aspects of revolution, uh, quite a bold thing to do at this time. So he talks about um, uh, revolution um, as the kind of phenomenon that might involve massive destruction, such as in the creation of the earth or when a room is swept out and piles of rubble are left behind. But these are to be seen as um, natural tendencies and hence beneficial tendencies. And when Herder showed these drafts to Goethe and asked him what he thought could be published, Goethe said not one single word could be published. If we look at it in this way, then revolution is an encapsulation of this idea that history is a natural process and that natural processes have their own history. He's writing under the influence of Buffon, but he's taking Buffon a step further. And what I mean by that is it seems to me that he is setting the stage for a new way to talk about natural history. And that is the way that points towards the later discussions developed in Marx and then in Adorno, the, um, the, the discussions that will um, be central to critical theory. Um, uh, clearly, Herder was not prepared to go as far as Adorno did when, um, in 1932, he described the task of analyzing natural history, and I quote, to grasp historical being in its external historical determination, there where it is most historical, as itself natural being, or to grasp nature there where it apparently resides most profoundly within itself, as historical being or as he later put it, and this is a little bit clearer, to see all nature and whatever might establish itself as such, as history, and all history as nature. So Herder clearly is not going to go this far, but he's certainly pointing the way. He's pointing the way to that later position by explaining how in their, or in our interpretive and explanatory actions, individuals and societies call into being their own nature and history. And in the process, we use language to negotiate the dividing line between what is given and what is mutable, what can be changed and what can't be changed, what appears changeable and what appears unchangeable. And this has to do with the representation of nature and of history. And representation is vital here, representation and interpretation. Towards the end of his letters on humanity, Herder addresses the question of what he calls the natural history of humanity, written in a purely human sense. The dream of such a history, which he unfolds in the 116th letter, sets out a subtle position on how to write humanity's diversity as both a natural and a historical fact. But it's a fact that's called forth in the act of writing. And this is really important for Herder. Writing and interpretation play the pivotal role when it comes to understanding how nature and history relate to one another. I think it's fair to say that there is a kind of a proto-critical theory aspect to Herder's dialectic of nature and history, or his dialectic of history and climate, if I can put it like that. And incidentally, he gave the title to one of the sections in his ideas, the conflict between climate and history. That's exactly what he's talking about here, the conflict between climate and history, or to put it differently, the dialectic of nature and history. But let's return to that cited passage that I began with, the long passage in the Letters on Humanity. Here, the whole point of thinking about nature and history, the whole point of thinking about human life on a changing planet, is to consider the role of the understanding and what he calls the expression of intellectual force. I call this impulse proto-critical since it points the way to the later understanding of intellectual activity in critical theory. And here I have to quote Adorno again. 
if you reflect, and Adorno was writing here on natural history, on the dialectic of natural history. And he says, if you reflect on what I have said to you about philosophical interpretation, you will perhaps be able to see why I have placed such great emphasis upon the theory of natural history. It is because this interweaving of nature and history must in general be the model for every interpretive procedure in philosophy. We might almost say that it provides the canon that enables philosophy to adopt an interpretative stance without lapsing into pure randomness. In the concept of intellectual force, Herder is opening up this field of interpretation that Adorno speaks of. And this returns me to the point I made at the beginning, that the interactions and the hierarchies between the disciplines are of vital importance when it comes to thinking about how we want to speak, what language we want to use, what tools of the understanding we want to use when it comes to looking at nature and history, looking at what can be changed and looking at what can't be changed. And this is why when I read Herder in um, passages like the one I'm talking about, it seems to me that what he is talking about he, is he's talking about the politicization of intellectual activity. And if you want the politicization of force, this little word force is kind of hidden in that passage and you may, might not have even really noticed it. But when he speaks about intellectual force, he's talking about how the intellect itself how, how the intellect itself encapsulates this dialogue of nature and history. Because what, after all, is intellectual activity? It is a biological process, and it situates um, thought firmly within the body, but it's also a historical process. So it's a natural process, and it's a historical process. Thought itself, interpretation itself, intellectual activity and philosophy partakes of the same dialectic of natural history that it attempts to unravel, that it attempts to come to terms with. And this brings me to my final closing thought. Um, the way to deal with this is aesthetic for Herder. And what I mean by that is aesthetics is that realm of intellectual activity that attempts to keep separate as far as possible what can be changed in nature and what cannot be changed in nature, what has to be assumed as given, this kind of theological thought that there is an aspect of nature which cannot be changed, which is larger than history, but then which collapses and folds back on itself as history. And it does this in the act of intellectual activity. And um, I'm reminded of uh, what uh, Christoph Menke writes in his brilliant little book, which he simply calls Kraft in German, Force, um, where he talks about this, how this, this, this situating of the realm of the aesthetic. And I'm going to close with a quote from Menke's book. For Menke, the aesthetics of force is driven by a force that is not of the subject, but of the human being this kind of psychoanalytical idea, a force which is not of the subject, but of the human being, as distinct from itself as a subject. The aesthetics of force is a doctrine of the nature of the human, its aesthetic nature as distinct from the actively acquired culture of its practices. So in intellectual force and also in aesthetic activity, this is where the human mind can explore this boundary between the changeability and the unchangeability of the given. Thank you very much.